In Matthew 16, 17, Jesus recognizes Peter for his declaration that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. This moment follows an inquiry by Jesus to his disciples about the various opinions people held regarding his identity. The disciples report that some believed Jesus to be John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or another prophet. Seeking a more personal response, Jesus asks his disciples directly who they think he is. Peter, known for his eagerness and boldness, immediately professes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus responds to Peter's declaration by pronouncing him blessed. This blessing signifies that Peter's understanding is not a result of human reasoning or influence, referred to as flesh and blood, but rather a direct revelation from God the Father. Jesus emphasizes that this revelation sets Peter apart, marking him as highly favored and uniquely privileged. This insight into Jesus' true character is not accessible through ordinary human means. It is a divine gift that means God's special love and favor towards Peter. Jesus' words accentuate that such knowledge is extraordinary, surpassing the capabilities of human intellect and wisdom. Also, Jesus affirms the blessedness of Peter's situation by contrasting him with others who remain in spiritual darkness, confused about Jesus' true nature. The religious leaders, scribes, and general populace, despite their learning and status, are unable to recognize Jesus as the Christ. Peter's discernment is thus a clear sign of divine grace, distinguishing him from the misguided majority. Jesus' acknowledgement of Peter's intuitiveness serves as an affirmation of the critical role of divine revelation in ascertaining spiritual truths. It illustrates that true knowledge of Jesus' identification is a gift from God, elevating those who receive it to a position of blessedness and favor. This passage asserts the profound importance of divine revelation in the Christian faith, setting a foundational principle for recognizing and proclaiming Jesus as the Christ. Moreover, Edwards highlights that God is the ultimate author of all knowledge, distinguishing between natural and spiritual knowledge. He indicates that while human beings can acquire and impart knowledge through learning and experience, this ability itself is a gift from God. Edwards references Exodus 28, 3, noting that the Israelites' skills in embroidery and other crafts were due to God filling them with the spirit of wisdom. This example demonstrates that even practical knowledge and skills, whether in arts, sciences, or business, originate from God, who uses natural means and human intermediaries to convey such knowledge. However, Edwards makes a clear distinction when it comes to spiritual knowledge, specifically the recognition of Jesus as the Son of God. This knowledge, as described in Matthew 16, 17, is revealed exclusively by God and not through human means. Edwards argues that this spiritual awareness is a direct gift from God, unmediated by any natural causes or human effort. He maintains that the disciples, despite their lack of formal education and societal standing, recognize Jesus' divine nature. In comparison, the scribes and Pharisees, who were highly educated and knowledgeable in other matters, remained ignorant of this truth. This stark difference points out that such spiritual comprehension is a result of divine revelation, not human wisdom or sagacity. Furthermore, Edwards elaborates that the circumstances leading to Jesus' statement in Matthew 16, 17 naturally prompted Christ to reiterate this divine source of knowledge, the disciples had reported the general confusion and mistaken beliefs about Jesus among the people. However, Peter's declaration of Jesus as the Son of God stood out as a clear and assured statement of faith. Jesus attributes this grasp not to human revelation, flesh and blood, but to God's direct and gracious influence. Edwards concludes that while human means can convey various forms of knowledge, the great spiritual truths, such as recognizing Jesus' divine nature, are exclusively shown by God, repeating the unique and divine origin of spiritual knowledge. In addition, Edwards discusses the doctrine of a spiritual and divine light communicated directly by God to the soul, distinct from natural means of acumen. He clarifies that this divine light is not a bare conviction of sin and misery. Natural men can feel guilt and fear of divine punishment through natural conscience and reason, assisted by the Spirit of God, but this is not the spiritual light he describes. The Spirit's assistance in convicting men of sin is not the infusion of new divine standards into the soul. Edwards underlines that this divine light is not an impression on the imagination. It is not a vision or image perceived by the mind's eye. 
While spiritual discoveries can affect the imagination, the divine light itself is not an imaginative impression. Natural men and even the devil can produce vivid imaginations of outward beauty or glory, but these are inferior to the true spiritual light. Further, he clarifies that the divine light is not the revelation of new truths not contained in scripture. Unlike the inspiration of prophets and apostles, this light does not suggest new doctrines or propositions. Instead, it provides a more profound knowledge and apprehension of truths already uncovered in the Bible. Besides, Edwards explains that this light is not merely religious intuition or affection. Natural conventions can cause men to be affected by religious stories or descriptions, but such affections do not equate to spiritual light. Even unregenerate men can be deeply moved by religious narratives or eloquent descriptions of heavenly states, but these emotional responses do not constitute the divine light. Edwards defines this spiritual and divine light as a true sense of the divine excellency of the things disclosed in the Word of God. It involves a direct experiential knowledge of God that transforms the soul, enabling it to see and appreciate divine truths in a way that natural faculties cannot achieve. This spiritual light is a gift from God, distinct from natural reason and imagination, resulting in a genuine, heartfelt conviction and delight in divine things. Additionally, Edwards defines divine illumination as a serious sense of the divine excellence of the truths displayed in Scripture, accompanied by a conviction of their reality. This spiritual light consists primarily in a genuine sense of the divine glory inherent in these truths. A saving conviction of their truth naturally follows from this vision of their divine glory, making this conviction a direct result of perceiving their divine nature. Edwards distinguishes between two kinds of perception or knowledge, speculative and sensory. Speculative knowledge is an intellectual recognition of something as good or excellent, while sensory knowledge involves an ardent sense of its beauty and sweetness, leading to pleasure and delight. For example, one might intellectually agree that honey is sweet, but only truly figures out its sweetness by tasting it. Similarly, a person might rationally acknowledge God's holiness and grace, but only through spiritual enlightenment can one truly sense their loveliness and beauty. This sense of divine excellence leads to a conviction of the truth of divine things both indirectly and directly. Indirectly, this spiritual sense removes prejudices against divine truths, allowing the mind to be more open to rational cases. The natural enmity and biases against the doctrines of the gospel are overcome, making the mind more receptive to their truth. This sanctification of reason and removal of prejudices help in better understanding and accepting divine truths. Also, this sense enhances reason by making speculative notions more intense and engaging the mind more acutely with divine objects. The mind, drawn by the beauty and sweetness of these objects, contemplates them with greater intensity and clarity, leading to a more accurate and thorough realization. Directly, the sense of divine excellency immediately convinces one of the truth of divine things due to their superlative and distinguishing beauty. This divine glory is so evident and transcendent that it naturally commands assent to their divinity and reality. This intuitive and immediate evidence of their divine nature characterizes the conviction in true saving faith, setting it apart from minor intellectual assent. In this manner, the true spiritual conviction in saving faith arises from a rich, cordial sense of the divine excellence of the truths unveiled in Scripture, leading to an unwavering belief in their truth and reality. This conviction, grounded in a direct perception of divine glory, weightily distinguishes genuine faith from pure intellectual agreement. Moreover, Jesus recognizes that Peter's observation about his divine nature is a revelation from God. Jonathan Edwards expands on this concept, explaining how divine light is conveyed directly by God and not acquired through natural means. Edwards first clarifies that natural faculties are indeed involved in receiving divine light. While the human intellect actively participates, it does not cause this elucidation. The faculties are interconnected as the subject of this light, similar to how our eyes help us see objects when the sun rises. The eyes do not produce the light, they slightly respond to it. Similarly, human faculties are involved in perceiving divine light, but are not the source of it. Furthermore, Edwards addresses the role of outward means, particularly the Word of God. He explains that this divine light brings a correct recognition of the truths revealed in Scripture. The Gospel aids as a medium through which this light is conveyed. Edwards describes this light as the light of the glorious Gospel of Christ, underscoring its reliance on biblical text. 
However, the scripture itself does not generate this divine light. It only presents the truths that the Holy Spirit then impresses upon the heart. The crucial point Edwards makes is that divine light is given directly by God, without relying on any natural or inherent power of the means employed. The Word of God conveys doctrines and truths to the mind, but the strong sense of their divine excellence is instilled in the heart by the Holy Spirit. The Scripture acts as a vessel for the doctrines, but the genuine appreciation and understanding of their divine nature come directly from God's Spirit. For instance, knowledge about Christ and His attributes might come from reading the Bible, but truly perceiving and valuing Christ's holiness and grace is an immediate transmission from the Holy Spirit. This distinction emphasizes that while intellectual acknowledgement of doctrine can be achieved through Scripture, the profound earnest sense of its divine beauty and truth is a direct work of the Spirit. In addition, Edwards accentuates that this divine illumination is both scriptural and rational, offering a powerful and life-changing knowledge of God and Christ unique to believers. He affirms that Scripture consistently supports the distinction between the godly, who possess this divine knowledge, and the ungodly, who do not. Edwards cites numerous biblical passages to demonstrate that the saints have a special knowledge and sight of God and Christ. For instance, 1 John 3, 6 and John 14, 19 assert that those who sin or do evil lack this sight, while believers see and know God. This knowledge, Edwards contends, is not hardly speculative but fundamentally different in nature from any knowledge the ungodly might have. It is a serious, immediate revelation from God, as described in Matthew eleven twenty five. 27, where Jesus thanks the Father for showing truths to the humble rather than the wise and prudent. This revelation is presented as an arbitrary act of divine will, distinguishing the recipients with unique spiritual judgment. Further, Edwards references 2 Corinthians 4, 6 to highlight that this spiritual light is directly from God, akin to the creation of light in Genesis. It is a divine act, illuminating the hearts of believers with the knowledge of God's glory, Psalm 119. 18. Where the psalmist prays for open eyes to behold wondrous things in God's law, also indicates this divine illumination, which refers to a deeper comprehension of God's perfections and glory, uncovered in His Word and works. Edwards maintains that a true and saving faith arises from this divine light. Citing John 6.40 and John 17. 6, eight. He shows that belief in Christ and the knowledge of God are interconnected with the spiritual sight imparted by Christ. This sight enables believers to recognize the divine origin and truth of Christ's teachings. In disagreement, those without this light, as exemplified in Luke 12, 56, 57, fail to determine the divine signs and truth, lacking an inward sense of God's excellence. Peter's testimony in 2 Peter 1, 16, recounting his witnessing of Christ's majesty, points out the assurance of the gospel's truth derived from seeing Christ's divine glory. Edwards debates that this assurance can be similarly grounded in the understanding of Christ's spiritual glory, which is inherently divine. This spiritual sight, therefore, contributes a rational basis for faith, paralleling the Apostle's eyewitness experience of Christ's transfiguration. In summary, Edwards articulates a compelling case for the existence and significance of divine light, reiterating that it is a scriptural and rational reality that thoroughly alters believers by granting them a unique direct knowledge of God and Christ. This divine illumination not only distinguishes the godly from the ungodly, but also forms the base of true, saving faith. Besides, Edwards explores the rationality behind this divine revelation. Firstly, Edwards supposes that it is rational to believe in the exceptional excellence of divine things— he disputes that divine matters possess a distinct and superior glory that sets them apart from human affairs. This inherent excellence is so weighty that, if perceived, it would undeniably convince individuals of their divine nature. Edwards uses the example of Christ's transfiguration to clarify how witnessing divine glory would inherently convince one of its divinity. Secondly, Edwards repeats that it is reasonable to expect that such divine excellence can be perceived. He argues that the inability of some individuals— especially those influenced by sin, to perceive this excellence does not negate its existence. Spiritual corruption blinds individuals to divine beauty, much like personal biases can impair judgment in secular matters. So, it is not irrational to believe that divine excellency can be seen, even if not everyone can differentiate it. Thirdly, 
Edwards discusses the rationality of this knowledge being communicated directly by God rather than through natural means. He questions the skepticism around divine communication, contending that it is reasonable for God, as the Creator, to have a direct influence on His creation, especially on intelligent beings created for His glorification. Edwards underlines that the supreme wisdom and grace conveyed by God are the highest gifts, immeasurably weighty, and hence fittingly bestowed directly by God. Lastly, Edwards debates that the ability to perceive the beauty and excellency of divine things is beyond the reach of natural reason alone. This perception connects the heart rather than relying solely on speculative or rational processes. While reason plays a role in grasping doctrines, the immediate perception of divine beauty is a fervent sense, not a rational deduction. This is akin to knowing the concept of sweetness versus actually tasting honey. Reason can recognize sweetness, but it cannot grant the personal experience of it. In this manner, recognizing divine excellency is a rational expectation that transcends natural reason and is directly passed on by God. Last but not least, Edwards investigates the gravity of divine illumination and its practical implications for believers. He underscores God's goodness in making the proof of the gospel accessible to everyone, regardless of intellectual capacity. This divine illumination means that individuals with limited education or reasoning skills can perceive the divine excellence of religious truths through the Spirit of God, rather than relying solely on complex logical claims. Edwards emphasizes that this spiritual understanding is often hidden from the learned and prudent, as accentuated in 1 Corinthians 1 26, 27, where God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Edwards calls for self-examination to determine whether one has experienced this divine light. He affirms that this is not a sheer fanciful notion, but a decisive aspect of spiritual life. True faith in the gospel and a genuine insight of Christ's glory come from this spiritual enlightenment, which is essential for a believer's assurance and growth. He urges everyone to seek this divine light earnestly, outlining several irresistible reasons. First, he notes that this spiritual wisdom surpasses all human knowledge, elevating the soul more than any intellectual achievement. Learning the divine glory of God and Christ is the highest form of knowledge, even surpassing that of angels and God himself. Second, the joy derived from this divine light exceeds any pleasure from human knowledge. It discloses the most beautiful and delightful truths to the soul, equipping peace and brightness even in adversity. This light is a foretaste of heavenly glory and affords unparalleled comfort and support. Third, this light profoundly influences and converts the soul, making it reflect the divine glory it beholds. It leads to a great intrinsic change, aligning one's inclinations with heavenly things and fostering a wholehearted commitment to God. This metamorphosis is a true conversion, shaping the heart to embrace the gospel and submit entirely to Christ. Finally, this divine light produces genuine, universal holiness in life, encouraging sincere love for God and furnishing a fascinating conviction of the rewards God promises to those who follow Him. This complete change in behavior and attitude is the authentic fruit of spiritual illumination. Basically, Edwards asserts that divine and supernatural light is important for a genuine, fruitful Christian life. It is the source of true wisdom, joy, renewal and holiness, far surpassing any human knowledge or effort. As a result, he encourages all believers to seek this light earnestly, experiencing its profound impact on their souls and lives. In conclusion, in Matthew 16, 17, Jesus praises Peter for recognizing him as the Christ, highlighting that this intuitiveness is a divine revelation rather than human deduction. Jonathan Edwards delves into this concept, indicating the integral role of divine illumination in perceiving spiritual truths. He differentiates between natural and spiritual knowledge, maintaining that while humans can learn practical skills, spiritual knowledge, like recognizing Jesus as the Son of God, is a direct gift from God. Also, Edwards clarifies that divine illumination is distinct from natural conviction, imaginative impressions, new doctrinal revelations, or simple religious emotions. It involves a serious sense of the divine excellence of biblical truths, molding the soul's perception and appreciation of these truths. This spiritual light enables a richer realization and hearty conviction of God's glory, surpassing the limitations of human intellect. Moreover, Edwards disputes that divine illumination is both scriptural and rational, giving believers a unique, direct knowledge of God and Christ. 
This spiritual sight forms the bedrock of true, saving faith by displaying an immediate, experiential conviction of divine truths. He argues that recognizing the inherent excellence of divine things is reasonable, even though it goes beyond natural reason and applies to the heart directly. Furthermore, the practical connotations of divine illumination for believers are consequential. Edwards points out that this spiritual awareness is accessible to all, regardless of intellectual capacity, and often hidden from the learned. It is vital for true faith and assurance, extending thorough wisdom, joy, transformation and holiness. This divine light leads to a strong, inherent change, aligning one's inclinations with heavenly things and promoting a genuine contact with God. To sum up, Edwards reiterates that divine illumination is crucial for a genuine and fruitful Christian life. It is the source of true spiritual knowledge, reconstructing believers' souls and lives in ways that surpass human recognition. This divine light supplies a weighty sense of God's glory, enabling believers to accept gospel truths with honest conviction and joy.